What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Mass Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your senior enlisted advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-host, Julie Mitchell. Hey, Julie, how you doing? Hi, Chief. Good to see you. I know. I know. It's a great day for a Chief Chat, right? Absolutely. Yes. And we got a special co-host today, uh, my brother in the arms and, form and, and, and a fellow devil dog, uh, from the Marine Corps Exchange, Master Gunnery Sergeant Jose Lopez. How you doing, Master Guns? Good, and yourself? I'm doing good, man. You looking real sharp back there, man. I, I feel underdressed for this interview. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> good stuff, good stuff. But we, we've been super blessed um, in the past probably month or so. We've had some really, really awesome Americans on uh, that have done some amazing things. And we got a true American hero and also a fellow devil dog uh, with us today. So we're going to keep that thing going today. And uh, Julie, please introduce today's guest. Thanks for that, Chief. And welcome, Mastery Gunnery Sergeant Lopez. It's a pleasure to have you join us today. This is a special Chief Chat episode. It's part of our In Recognition of series where we are honored to salute our nation's heroes this month, like today's guest, our friends at the Navy Exchange, Marine Corps Exchange, Coast Guard Exchange, and Defense Commissary Agency are helping us host these special episodes throughout November. Today's guest is an American hero and a living legend. He recently celebrated his 97th birthday and is the sole surviving Marine from World War II to wear the Medal of Honor. And he is the last surviving Medal of Honor recipient from the 1945 Battle of Iwo Jima. His personal commitment to veterans and Gold Star families continues today through the Herschel Woody Williams Medal of Honor Foundation. Please help us welcome Chief Warrant Officer for Herschel Woody Williams. Hey. Thank you, thank you. So glad to have you with us. And for all of those who are watching, drop us a note in the comments and let us know where you're watching from. Share some love with Woody in the comments below and you can leave questions for him too. We will try to get to them live. Now is a great time to start a watch party so you can enjoy this live interview with your friends. We have terrific guests lined up throughout the rest of 2020. So if you're not following our page, you should so you can stay in the know. Oh man. So sir, sir, it is truly an honor to have you with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, everybody at the Military Exchange and Commissary just appreciate your service and your dedication to our great nation. And we want to just take some time to just say thank you uh, up front for taking some time to, um, to talk to us today. My pleasure. Thanks. I echo Chief Office Settlement. Great to have you with us. Where are you joining us from? And how have you been faring during this pandemic? Well, I, in much uh, starting in March through about uh, July, I pretty well stayed in my residence and went out in my car and that sort of thing, but sort of stayed away from people because we were so unsure of how this thing was going to work and how it was going to affect us. But starting August, why well, we decided back on the road again. So we've been uh, we've been traveling since then and. We've been to Florida and and Kentucky, and we were supposed to be in Texas this week, but uh, because of this upsurge in in the viruses all over the country, we decided we better stay in West Virginia, where we got a little more open territory, not Texas, but we won't be in groups of people, and so I'm I'm surviving and. Like everybody else, we're doing everything we can to stay safe. Glad, glad to hear that. Glad to hear that you're taking precautions and um, being being safe. Yeah, so, and, and we and we and if you ever come, whenever you decide to come to Texas, come check us out in uh in Dallas. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's we'd love to have you. <laughs> we were supposed to go to Fort Worth, and then to Keller, and then Corsicana. Uh, Right down the road. Yes, sir. Yeah. So you um, mentioned West Virginia. You grew up on a farm in West Virginia, one of 11 children. What led you to enlist with the Marines at age 21 in 1943? <laughs> well, uh, when uh, Pearl Harbor was uh, bombed, I happened to be in the Civilian Conservation Corps that we called the Three C's back in those days. 
And that had started during the depression years to give our youth, boys like me, uh, something to do, some way of earning some money and maybe even learning a trade. And they ended up with something like 750,000 of us serving in the Civilian Conservation Corps. And I joined it when I was 16 years of age because I had a brother already had joined and he had uh, a little bit of money and I didn't have any. And I figured, well, if they're going to give him money, I'll go in and I'll get some too. <laughs> of course, I ended up in Montana and he stayed in West Virginia. But the, the day that Pearl Harbor was bombed, the day after, they called us out and told us that uh, America was going to war. None of us, or at least in my group of my community, we knew nothing about the war. We didn't know what was going on because we had no newspaper. Very few people had, didn't have a radio. We didn't have a radio. So we had no way of knowing what was going on in the world. But <clears throat> they did tell us we were going to war and the three C were going to be discontinued. If we were over 18 years of age, we could go direct into the army from CCCs. But if we were under 18, then we had to have a parent consent. Uh, my father had deceased when I was 11 and I knew mom wasn't gonna sign my paper. I just knew that, so yeah. no sense in asking. So I came home at 17 and tried to get her to sign the paper and she wouldn't do it. So the month after my 18th birthday, I wanted to go in the Marine Corps. The reason I wanted to go in the Marine Corps was because of the uniform. That's <laughs> not silly, but that's not true. Uh, yeah, gun, gun is making me want to go back right now. What, Master, gun, Master Guns <laughs> is making me want to go back. Hey, well, we, we had got a guy in our, in our community that uh, came home on a 30-day furlough. Back in those days, you got home one time a year. And that was a 30-day furlough. That's what he would come home and he had to wear his dress blues all the time he was home. And that was their order and he fulfilled that. Well, he was very popular in our community and girls just loved him. So, well, that's the way to go. So, <laughs> so I, when I went in to join the Marine Corps, I was really doing it for two basic reasons. One, to protect my country and two, to protect my freedom. I, I never dreamed that I would leave, and leave the United States of America. I thought I would stay right here with all the others going in to defend our country so that no one could take our country and our freedom away from us. But of course, in boot camp, I learned that the, you know, the war isn't here, it's over there. Mm -hmm. Never heard tell of. And I don't think I even knew we had a South Pacific Ocean at that time in my life. <laughs> that's where we were headed anyway. And <clears throat> so uh, that basically is why I joined the Marine Corps was because of the influence of that uniform. Awesome, awesome. So um, I, want, I want to kind of set the stage for the day we're, we're going to talk about. Um, so you were a flamethrower operator, which when I, when I read that, I was like, man, I know that MOS is probably probably not existed uh, nowadays, uh, but it's, it sounds cool, cool as all get out, right? Uh, and, and, and I know before we before we got on the uh, the live, you said that they just handed you a flamethrower and said, kind of figure, figure it out. <laughs> that, that's right, yeah. Um, I recall we were on Guadalcanal at that time. Uh, we were there, we'd been shipped to Guadalcanal to get equipped with uh, combat uh, material, combat uniform and, and weapons and all that to actually to Bougainville because that's where the third Marine division was fighting at that time to take Bougainville. And they had lost a tremendous number of Marines wounded and killed. So our group replacement unit to go in and fill in those vacancies and help with the, with the battle. But before we could, they could get us all shipped out and equipped and all of that, the Marines on Bougainville Security Island, they came then to Guadalcanal and they had come from New Zealand to Bougainville, now to Guadalcanal 
And that's where I joined the Third Marine Division. And shortly after I got there, I got there in December of 43, January 44, we got these huge wooden crates in, shipped to each unit, each company. And we didn't know what was in them because you couldn't, they were covered. And we, when we opened them, here was a frame floor that none of us had ever seen before. We didn't know wow. what, you know. Of course, it had a manual with it that uh, told us all the part numbers and how to take it apart and put it together and, and how to fix the fuel and that sort of thing. But how do you use it in combat? Nothing. Didn't, tell, didn't explain that. So we had to figure that out ourselves and selected or the company commander selected a special group, special weapons unit to be a flamethrower and demolition people. We were trying both ways. We could either burn it up or blow it up, whichever. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. we began training that way for the next campaign, which happened to be Guam. So from January to June, we trained on uh, flamethrower and demolition and then went to Guam to take Guam back. Yeah. In, in 42. Awesome, awesome. So, so you, like you said, like you said before, you were a flamethrower operator in a in Third Marine Division. So you earned the Medal of Honor for for actions taken in World War II at the Battle of Iwo Jima. And for for any Marine, that's that's a historic, monumental um, uh, battle that that you know we learn as soon as we get into uh, boot camp. They they yeah. didn't teach us about Iwo Jima and all that stuff. So uh, on February twenty third, nineteen forty five. Uh, the tanks had encountered a network of concrete pillboxes. And so for people that don't know where pillboxes are, uh, it, they're like, uh, it's, it's like a bunker with a concrete, it, 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 it's a bunker that has concrete uh, protection and little holes where you can shoot out of and, and stuff like that. It, it, am I right? Yes, you are. And uh, so- They, um, had, they had what we called an aperture in the front of the pillbox that went across the face of it. And it was about eight inches tall, the, the aperture or the hole was, and the, uh, uh, the enemy inside could stick the rifles out that aperture and they had a whole field of fire out there. And all we had was that little <laughs> opening to shoot to try to keep them from shooting it out. Yes. Uh, the, the troops, the tanks did incur the, the pillboxes. We called them in or the the authorities called them in to try to bust up those pillboxes because they had a they had a pretty good sized gun on every tank. But it was the troops really that encountered, tried to break through the pillbox areas. And time we would jump up and run and try to approach the pillboxes, uh, we'd just get annihilated because we had that small field of fire and they had an open field of fire. So uh, we were just losing Marines and we'd attack and then we'd have to back off because we'd lose so many people. And uh, the pillboxes were built so that kind of in, in pods so that one could see, one pillbox could see the attack on another pillbox. So you couldn't sneak up on them. You just had to approach them from the front. And flamethrower became such a vital weapon on uh, uh, because of the pillboxes. Uh, history I have that somebody wrote said that uh, <clears throat> the general had built 800 pillboxes which came of various sizes. One man, five, some of them had a number, a great number of people in them. They were good size. And they were reinforced with uh, metal rods that we call today, but they were just metal rods to us. And uh, even tanks couldn't blow them apart. Uh, bazookas couldn't do anything with them. And the only way to eliminate the enemy was to get something inside the pillbox. And that's where the flamethrower came in to play. Yeah, and so it said that for over four hours, you used the flamethrower to eliminate those pillboxes. Um, and it also left a hole for the tanks to get through. Um, yeah. yeah, so can, can you kind of kind of walk us through that or, or what was going on uh, at, in, that, in that moment or? 
Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> we had that particular day, the 23rd, our first real day of combat. We had crossed wow. the first airfield and uh, we lost a tremendous number of Marines just getting across the airfield because there was no protection. You had to jump up and run. If you could find a shell crater, you'd jump in it or, or you know, try to find something to give you some protection. But uh, they had the airfields covered with, it, with all kinds of weapons. And <clears throat> once we got across the airfield, that's when we encountered all these pillboxes that had been built to protect the airfield. And as we would approach those or attack those, uh, that's when we would lose additional Marines. And uh, my, my commanding officer, he and two other officers in our company were the only two left. The rest of them had been wounded and killed and mm -hmm. most of the squad leaders were gone and gunnery sergeants were also gone. So uh, he called for a meeting of whatever left NCOs he had. And I was a corporal. I was acting sergeant, and by the way, they never did pay me for it either. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I, I was acting sergeant, so uh, I wasn't going to go to the meeting because I didn't qualify as an NCO. But my the first sergeant told me that he wanted me there, and I joined him in a big shell crater with other Marines, and he was trying to figure out what we're going to do. And at that point, I had six flamethrower demolition people with me when I hit the beach. Six of those were either wounded or killed, and I never did know which. Still don't to this day know what happened to them. But I had two of them assigned to each company, A, B, and C company. And if the, uh, if the uh, platoon leader needed a flamethrower demolition, he would tell them they would get the equipment, do the job, then go back to be a rifleman again because they weren't all that stuff with them. They couldn't. And <clears throat> they were gone. So he still asked me if I could do something with a flamethrower because I was the only guy left in the company. You know, and I had been in headquarters. That's why I was still left. So I, I don't know what I answered. Uh, other Marines said I, my response was I'll try so whatever it was uh, he gave me four marines told me to pick four marines to help me and see what I could do with the flamethrower and uh, I did that placed them in a position where they would shoot at the whatever pillbox I was trying to get to to fire at that aperture so keep them from being able to fire at me and Two of those Marines sacrificed their life that day, protecting me. But uh, the pillboxes, many of them, it, the memory won't come back. It, it, uh, I don't know what, I didn't want to remember it or what happened, but uh, the first, one of the first ones that I was trying to reach to, I'm, I'm, on, I'm crawling on my belly up a ditch and the, uh, they're shooting at me with what we called Nambu back in those days, like a 30 caliber machine gun. And they, they were firing at me with that and <clears throat> the bullets were ricocheting off of my flamethrower. Mm. Fortunately, or I wouldn't be talking to you, when they hit the flamethrower, it was real heavy metal and would not penetrate it. We tried to penetrate it, see if it would, it would explode or do something, but they ricocheted up and stood it down, and uh, I continued to crawl to where they couldn't reach me. And but uh, I saw smoke coming up out of the top of the pillbox, just a wee little blue smoke. And I thought, well, there's got to be a hole up there if the smoke's coming out. Mm -hmm. So I crawled up on top of the pillbox, and uh, there was a vent pipe there. Uh, the Japanese had put a number of people in these pillboxes and some of them they sealed the, so they couldn't get back out. They had to live there. And, and uh, the smoke was where they had had some kind of a cooking thing or smoke from the weapons. I'm not sure what it was from, but 
when I got up on top, I stuck my flamethrower nozzle down that pipe and eliminated that the group in there. Uh, that I remember very well. Uh, the other real vivid memory I have is I'm trying to reach a pillbox and uh, whether they had run out of ammunition or just decided to try to get me, I'm not sure which, but they came charging out of the, around the pillbox, uh, four or five of them, or maybe six of them. Uh, well, I wasn't counting, but they were after me with, uh, with their bayonets and I still had some fuel and flame left. So I got them instead of them getting me. Those two are the most vivid of the seven that I knocked out. Uh, I used six flamethrowers in that four hour period. Uh, one of the things that has bothered me all my life, still does, how do I get the additional flamethrowers? I had one when I started, but how do I get the other five? I can't remember, they were back in headquarters company and I jokingly said, I don't think anybody ever yelled at me and said, just wait there, I'll bring you one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think they ever did that, but, oh. <laughs> you know, but anyway, uh, the testimony of my commanding officer and the other Marines are the reason I have the Medal of Honor. Had they not been willing to make that recommendation and those Marines not been willing to testify as to what took place that day, I would not be privileged to wear this medal around my neck. Because all I was doing was the job that I'd been trained by other Marines to do. And if they hadn't trained me, I couldn't have done it. So I give them credit for it. And so uh, just, can, can I ask, how old were you at the time when this happened? I was 21. Man. When I received the medal uh, from President Truman, I was 22 and three days old. Yeah, that's, that's crazy to think a 21-year-old, you know, has that m much gumption and fortitude to, to, to go out and, and, but it's, like you said, it's what we're trying to do. It, it's what we were called to do. And it's just, but just trying to go back to 20, 20 year old KO is just, he was just an idiot. <laughs> and, and he, you know what I'm saying? And I don't know if, but I, I know it, I was trained enough to, if I was put in a position that I would, uh, I would do something for my brothers and sisters. And so that's, sure. that's awesome. I, I, I commend you for that. Thank you. That was your job. That, that's what I was supposed to do. You know, I wasn't doing anything. I didn't think outstanding. I thought I was just doing what, what <laughs> that gunnery sergeant said you ought to do, you know? Yeah. I'll always listen to gunning. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> you like your mother. Yeah. <laughs> that same day, the Marines raised the flag at Montserrabachi. You witnessed this. What do you remember about that now iconic moment? Well, I've uh, been asked that question a lot of times. Uh, uh, but, uh, we were right at the edge of the of the airfield. Uh, let me back up just a little bit. After the first day and the loss of so many Marines, we were notified about midnight of that first day that we going ashore uh, to get involved in the battle. But when we got on the Higgins boats the next morning and went out to circle and get in a rendezvous area, waiting for the beach master to say, you know, come on in, uh, the Marines ashore had not been able at that point to get enough ground that we could even get ashore. There was no place to go because they were pinned to the beach. And we went back aboard ship that night, stayed another, board, another night aboard ship. And then the next day, back in the Higgins boats. And that day, about or a little before noon, we got in. And uh, we were right at the edge of the airfield. And we had been told that our job was to cross the airfield and uh, attack the pillboxes. We knew that much. I'm lying on the on the ground, I, I said, I think I had my head buried in the sand, but uh, the first thing I knew, uh, realized that there was something happening was 
around me began saying something about or yelling about a flag, and some of them were actually standing up, firing their weapons into the air, you know, like celebrating something. And they're all looking back toward Mount Kiribati, and I, I'm looking the other way. I'm looking across the airfield, and Kiribati is back behind me. But they're all looking back that way, and I get up and look, and Old Glory had just, the second flag, had just been put up. And, uh, that was, uh, it had just, just reached this uh, uh, top of the pole and opened up. And that's what I saw. Uh, the first one, we didn't even know that it went on. We had no information about that or any, any uh, vision of it. But the second one, that's what I saw was old glory, that six by eight flag flying straight. I looked up there. So it made a difference to all of us. <laughs> what a sight to see for sure. <laughs> yes. Well, I have said many times, we raised a flag on every island we ever took. But usually we waited until the campaign was over, then we put up a flagpole and put the flag up, you know, because the battle's over. But this time, this uh, lieutenant that uh, was from the 28th Marines, he wanted to have a souvenir. I've been told this, I guess it's right. He wanted to have a souvenir of Old Glory flying for the first time on enemy territory. Because all the other islands we'd taken did not belong to Japan. They'd occupied them, but they belonged to some other country. And Iwo was actually enemy territory. And he apparently knew that. So he got a flag from the ship supply. That's where he got his three by five flag. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Took it ashore with him because he won that as his souvenir. You know, that would have been a very valuable situation. And, and, and that's why the Navy didn't like us on our on their ships, because we take, take their stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, I've been told that after he got it up, then he realized he couldn't take it down. <laughs> he replaced another flag. He had, to, he had to have a flag all the time, you know. So he was runner. You know, back in my day, every officer had a runner. And... The runner was a gopher boy, you know, gopher. gopher <laughs> and uh, he sent his runner back to get a bigger flag. And uh, there's two stories about this one. I'm not sure which is correct, that uh, he had somebody bring one from the ship. And the other story is that he got on a Higgins boat and went back to the ship and got this uh, six by eight and brought it back. I don't know which is true, but... Anyway, that, that's the one that uh, Rosenthal, when it, when it went up, the bigger flag, and that's the one that we see in the, all the images, of course. Well, I guess he got his three by five flag. <laughs> 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 so, sir, you received the Medal of Honor on October 5th, 1945 from President Truman for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty. What do you remember about that day and the ceremony? Well, uh, I'm going to back up just a little bit because sure. I'm in Guam. Uh, and we would, uh, when we came back from me, we dream up our whole training system changed. Up until that time, all our training had been jungle warfare. How do, how do you fight in a jungle? But when we came back from uh, Iwo, we began training, how do you fight in a city? How do you approach a house or go into a house or walk down a street? And, uh, because we'd never done that. And <clears throat> so when... Uh, when I was uh, uh, notified, my first sergeant called me to his tent and uh, said that uh, I was to get in my khaki uniform, which was just a trousers and shirt and tie and cover. And uh, I was going to the general's tent. I'm a corporal. What in the world am I going to the general's tent? It's <laughs> daylights out of me because you don't go to the general's tent unless you're in trouble. 
you just don't go visit with the general, you know. And uh, I asked him why, and he said, oh, I don't know. They just called and told me you are to come to the general's tent, okay? So I got in a Jeep with a driver and he took me to the general's tent and I went into General Erskine's office. And, and uh, if he mentioned at that time the word Medal of Honor, it didn't mean a thing to me because I'd never heard tell of it. I, I didn't want, you know, that's, <laughs> I've used the example if you, uh, I still don't know what it is, but if you said to me eight years or 10 years ago, gigabyte, I would have thought, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, I still don't know what it is, but at least I know the word. <laughs> so uh, uh, he gave me a set of orders and told me that I was going back to the States and I was to report to the White House uh, on, on uh, October the 3rd. Well, anything else that he said wasn't very important because I got to come home. That's, that's all I can think about. You know, I've been over there for almost two years. I'm ready to come home. <laughs> <laughs> so when I got to Washington, I still really didn't know why I was there. There were 13 of us that day. Uh, they were from Guam, Saipan, uh, Tinian, and, uh, and Iwo. And all the medals of these 13 had already been approved to be awarded, but apparently they weren't going to call us back and give it to us while the war was still going on. So now all of us are ordered into Washington at the same time, 13 of them. And uh, of course, as you all know, in military, you go alphabetical by whatever you do. You eat alphabetical and you sleep alphabetical, you, you just go alphabetical. So yeah. what is pretty close to the end of the line and I had one guy by the name of Zimmer who was one guy passed me he was number 13 I'm number 12 but uh, we're sitting there and we were able to take some of our family I took my mother and my uh, future wife with me uh, and some of the others had family with them and they're calling each one of us up individually to stand before the president while they read their citation. I had never heard the words in that citation. I'd never seen it or didn't even know it existed. So I'm hearing these words, but where did they come from? Yeah. And <clears throat> then when they, finish, uh, uh, when they finish reading the citation, that's when the president puts the ribbon around your neck with the medal. At that point, my body was shaking so bad <sighs> I could not be still. I mean, I was absolutely scared to death. I never thought I'd ever see a president, let alone you know, stand face to face with him. And uh, President Truman was a very common individual, as far as I could tell. And he uh, had something to say to everybody that he presented the medal to. And he said different, different things in different ways, but... Uh, one of his favorites was, I'd rather have this medal than to be president. And he said that to me, but he said it to others. And one of the others was a 17-year-old uh, Jackson Lucas uh, that joined the Marine Corps when he was 14 years old and now oh. has not reached his 18th birthday and he is now receiving the Medal of Honor for his on Iwo Jima. Uh, he pulled a couple grenades under him and saved some lives and they felt him worthy of having the medal. And when he said those words to Jack, Jack wasn't scared like I was, I don't guess, because everybody heard Jack yell out big loud when President Truman said, I'd rather have this medal than to be president. Jack yelled, I'll trade you. <laughs> 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 that goes down in history. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but I was, I was just absolutely scared to death. And uh, I don't know whether I was more scared that day or the next day when I had to go to uh, before the Commandant of the Marine Corps. A.A. Uh, a. Vandegrift was the Commandant at that time, and he had received his Medal of Honor from the 
battle of Guadalcanal. So a range who received the medal that day, we all had to go see the commandant individually, not together, but each one of us had to go into his office and meet him and, and he talked to us. And, uh, he, knew, he knew the life change it was going to be for all of us because it happened. To him. That's awesome. Man, that's 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 a awesome story, and it, it, like you said, it sounded like you were scarier on the ceremony than the actual event it took place. Because, <laughs> but uh, man, we, we appreciate everything that you've done. So after your military career, you uh, you continue your life of service. Obviously, um, tell us about the the Herschel Woody Williams Foundation and its mission to uh, install monuments across the United States. Well, you know, Gold Star Mothers for years and years, really starting in World War One. Our mothers were recognized and honored in many ways, and some communities even put statues of a of a lady representing Gold Star Mother. And that went on for years and years. And uh, of course, my job of the VA was when somebody lost their life in the service, the military was done with them. They didn't do anything in those days. The people to the VA in order to receive the benefits that they were entitled to, to get their insurance and everything else, because the military wasn't involved after the loss. And so over my career, I, I dealt with a great number of individuals, families, loved ones that had lost a uh, loved one in the armed forces. So I was pretty familiar with that grief and circumstances. And we recognized Gold Star Mothers many, many times in many speeches that we would make, we'd recognize Gold Star Mothers because mother's pretty important to all of us. Absolutely. Well, we had a greater influence on us than most dads. And uh, so that went on for years, but eventually in 2008, I was speaking to a group of uh, senior citizens and uh, we had, number of gold star mothers in the group i had recognized them or the we all recognized them but when it was over a father stayed uh, after everybody left and and he walked up to me and he was he was shedding tears at the time because he had just recently lost his only son in afghanistan and uh, the mother had already predeceased the boy into the military, going into the army. And uh, the only thing he said to me was, as he, he was, dad's cry too. And I asked him to share his story with me, and he, he agreed. But he told me that uh, he was the only son of his family, and he only had one boy. And that he lost, of course, and uh, <clears throat> that he was home when the military uh, in Afghanistan, of course, now we're visiting the fact before we release the official notification, as you all know, and he's the one that got what we now say is the knock on the door. And nobody to share with, he had no family in the area, he didn't know any other Gold Star family members of any, uh, nobody. So he just had to uh, grieve with this thing alone. And at that time, on the way back from there, I had about a two hour drive to get back home. And uh, I thought, you know, West Virginia has suffered over 11,000 of our West Virginians in the armed forces. And we had never done a thing for the families of those fam of those individuals. Them, we never mentioned them or talked about them or anything. Gold Star Mothers, yes, we did. We had a, a Gold Star Mothers unit in our state, and there's six or eight or ten mothers that belong to that group. But uh, I decided on the way back we must do something in West Virginia to recognize those families. Anybody else, you know, gave one of their own. So uh, we 
proposed a, an idea to uh, a group that we were working with on a veteran cemetery and eventually we did the very first Gold Star Family Memorial Monument Cemetery on uh, October the 2nd, 2013. And we thought we were done. We had done what we should have done a long time ago. We got on the internet and the son of a, of a father who had lost his life in Vietnam, living in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, went on the internet and he said, well, we need to do something like that in our community. So he went to work, formed a committee, raised money and did it. You know, that was number two. So it's continued to grow now and, and uh, communities all over this country have come together getting Gold Star family members together and uh, others. And so we have now dedicated 76 uh, of these Gold Star family memorials in 49 states, uh, even as far away as, as uh, Hawaii. And we had one scheduled for March in uh, Guam, but the virus had to cancel or cause to cancel that one. Uh, every state has more than one or many states have more than one. Uh, but the families are coming together for the very first time, getting acquainted with each other, being able to share with each other and be gold star families. Uh, it, it's such a rewarding thing to see them know first time they've got somebody else in the same situation they are and they share with each other it's, it's exceedingly uh, rewarding when you can see a father or a mother or a widow or a family member walk up and touch one of these memorials that it represents their loved one it, if it doesn't get to you you haven't got a heart yeah, damn. So uh, there will be more, and we've got about 73 in the process someplace in the country right now, additional, not finished yet, because they're forming committees, locating locations to put it, and raising funds and all those sorts of things. So what we started, we never dreamed it would ever reach this point. Uh, we thought if we could just get one in every state, that would be wonderful. But the way it has uh, grown and the uh, interest that has been shown by the members of, of communities, it, or communities, it's just uh, rewarding. And I'm just hogging the wheel. I'm just keep it turning, and yeah. they keep doing the work. <laughs> so, it's wonderful. Absolutely. We thank you for that, too. Well, they're, they're doing all the effort, and all we're doing is furnishing a way to get it accomplished. Why is remembering Gold Star family so important to you? How can our viewers get involved? Well, number one, uh, when I came home in 1945, the, one of the best friends I ever had in my growing up years was a schoolmate, uh, Leonard Brown. He, he lived about a quarter of a mile farther away from school than I did. And back in my day, we didn't have any buses to take us to school. We walked back and forth every day. And we had no days either. If it snowed, it didn't make any difference. You still went to school. You know? <laughs> uh, Leonard lost his life. Uh, he was a nose gunner on a B-20. And uh, the ACAC got, uh, got him and uh, wounded him severely. He died about four days later. So when I came home, I learned that for the first time. I didn't know Leonard had been killed. We'd never corresponded or contacted each other while we were gone. He was in the, uh, of course, the Air Force, Army Air Corps, and I was in the Marine Corps. But uh, that had a tremendous impact upon me. I was very close to his mother and father. So uh, 
There were other instances, like, as I said, dealing with uh, survivors of those who have been lost in the efforts uh, doing my job also had impact as I went along. But, uh, I lost the last half of your question. How can our viewers get involved, sir? Oh, thank you. Yeah, that, that's very important. <clears throat> well, if you live in a com every community of any size have Gold Star families living there because of the number of people that we have lost over the years. If you are a Gold Star family, you would, or even a com uh, person in the community who would like to uh, have a memorial, something to represent those that were lost. Con our, uh, our foundation, we have a complete outline, diagram with all the information that you would need to form a committee, how to raise funds, uh, how to get approval to get the community approval or, or city approval or state, whichever it may be. Uh, and it leads you down that path that really all you need are people and money and you can get it accomplished. And so that's one, that's the best way as far as I'm concerned is to uh, get a memorial so that those families and those communities will their loved one has not been forgotten. Thank you for what you're doing. That that really matters. It really makes a difference. And you're touching lives all over the country. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Well, right now, we'd like to see our next goal that we're working on. We're, as I said, we're, we've got 49, and the other one's Montana, and they've already got their committee, and they're beginning. Good. To, so we're going to get them. We won't <laughs> let them off. But we would also like to, we'd also like to see one of these on a every capital grounds of our states, because the ones in the community represent the Gold Star families in that particular community. But if we have one on the capital grounds, then it would represent every lost individual who sacrificed their life any time in our history, it would represent all of them. And right now we have got West Virginia, Louisiana, Arkansas and Kentucky. All of those have now a one on their capital grounds. So we'd like to see the other states come aboard and put one on their capital grounds to represent their total population. And it would have a different meaning, I think, than just just a community memorial. Absolutely. What a wonderful okay. idea. That's what's wonderful. I, I hope you can make that happen across the nation. For these, well, we're, uh, not, we're not going to give up. <laughs> I don't imagine you will. Nothing about you says give up. So yeah, I can't imagine you <laughs> giving up at all. Um, so Woody, you, I mean, just listening to you talk for the last, uh, you know, 45 minutes, a, a life of service, it's, it's had an incredible life of service and service like yours is so vital to our country. What do you want all Americans, young and old, to know about serving others and protecting our freedoms? Well, you know, I was raised, of course, in a different era. And we were a proud America with all states being involved and in having one, one particular government and we were known as, and we were proud to say, I am from America, the United States of America. Somehow, someone with a foresight and energy and ability must rise up and somehow restore us to a United States of America. Because if we don't do that, then I fear, I won't see it in my time, but I fear that we will become a separated group of people and lose that unity that we have all always been so proud to say 
that we are one people with one purpose, the freedom of ourselves and the freedom that we can give to anybody else. Awesome, awesome. That's great words and we appreciate those words. So, um, you know, you've had a lot of amazing stuff happen to you in your career or in your lifetime, I'm sorry. Um, and so one of those was uh, you had a, a, a Navy expeditionary sea base ship commissioned in your honor, uh, the USNS Herschel Woody Williams. And you were there for the christening. So can you tell us what that was like? Well, there have been so many miracles happen in my life. Uh, and I keep saying and I keep asking the question over and over and I don't find an answer yet. Why me? Why me? Why Herschel Woody Williams? I don't have an answer to that. I never dreamed in my wildest dreams that I would ever have a ship, my name on it, sailing the seven seas. That just, uh, I'm a land bird. <laughs> I don't live on the beach. In fact, I don't even like beaches. <laughs> but uh, why that happened? And of course it was because of others. And that's been true in my life. What happened to me is because others did something to make it possible. I couldn't have done this by myself. So I am so exceedingly proud for the things that have happened to me and feel so very fortunate that others would think me worthy to have these things with my name on them. Uh, the National Guard unit, the, the only one in the country that's got a name, name for a Marine. Yeah. <laughs> all, all the others are named for something else, you know. Uh, but those things happen, and I don't have the answer except so humbled and so proud that people have been willing to give their time and effort to make it in my life. Man. Well, you, you've, done, you've done so much for other people as well. So, um, it, it, you know, it goes both ways. So, so I, I know it's probably overwhelming to, to realize that, but, um, you know, yes. what you did for, for your fellow Marines uh, at, on that day was, was amazing. And what you're, what you're doing continually at, even after the service. So we, we, we love you and we appreciate you for that. Well, when you do something for somebody else, there is something takes place within your heart that cannot come from any other source. Yeah. It just does something for you because you have the great privilege of doing something for somebody else. So we, we would love to know where you're up to now. And at the age of 97, you, you, don't, you don't seem to be slowing down. What's ahead for you? Well, I'm going to continue going as hard as I can go and keep on, keep on, keep on. But uh, the foundation that we have is run primarily by uh, actually three of my grandsons. You know, one of them is the president, the other one is the director of uh, programs, and and the other one does the finance situation uh, with the uh, foundation. So those individuals, nothing would have ever happened. Absolutely. But I want to continue pushing this thing so that families all over our country will receive some recognition for the sacrifices that they have made. Your life in the armed forces of our country is different than any other reason or cause or happening of somebody sacrificing their life. They don't have to do this. There's nothing requiring them to actually raise their right hand and take an oath to say, you may take my life, but you cannot take my freedom. A very definite commitment. I hope I can continue to promote that and somehow and still are our youth, but some that it is such a great pleasure and obligation, if you will, to serve our country 
so that we cannot and will not lose the freedom and privileges that we have. Yes, sir. Sir, wanted to pause just for a moment and um, turn our attention to our Facebook live feed where you have people watching from all over the world and they're, they're leaving comments. Um, we'll start with Tina Stats. Tina says, hi from your hometown of Milton, West Virginia. Oh. Tina. <laughs> yeah, I only live three miles from there. <laughs> <laughs> so she's, you have a hometown, hometown girl in the house watching. She said her grandfather also served uh, in World War II and was also a flamethrower. Um, so that's, that's very interesting. Um, you are getting so much love. So many people saying thank you. Vanessa Garza says, he is a true testament of resilience and courage. Please tell him we thank him for his bravery and actions. So young and making such incredible decisions. As someone else says, such wise words. Um, somebody said they got chills when you were talking about old glory going up. Um, <laughs> you're just getting an amazing, amazing feedback. People love what you're doing to honor Gold Star families. Um, someone was asking what the what the one state was where there wasn't a monument, but you mentioned it was Montana and you're, you're gonna get there. So just an incredible, incredible feedback from our viewers. Thank you. Wow, well, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Sir, before we say goodbye, do you have any parting words for our viewers? Uh, well, my final word, I guess, would be be proud of who you are. Be thankful for the privileges that you have because we walk in the footprints of all of those who have sacrificed their life to give us in the way of freedom and our life in America. Man, that's drop the microphone on that one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you did. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so uh, Chief Warrant Officer Williams, uh, thank you so much for being with us today. I just want to personally thank you for uh, blazing the trail for people like me and Master Guns to, to serve this great nation as well. Uh, we, we definitely, like you say, we, we follow in the footsteps of greatness. And we just hope that we can carry that legacy on and pass it on to the, the future that's coming coming behind us. Um, yeah. it, your story is incredible. We we definitely appreciate you, you know, sitting down and chatting with us and telling us your story. And 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 I felt the emotions uh, as you were kind of you know walking us through through that day and, and the ceremony and all the other stuff. Uh, this means just so much to our soldiers, airmen, uh, Marines, Space Force personnel, uh, Coast Guard members. Uh, everybody, um, man, everybody is inspired by what you've done uh, for this country and in your lifetime and what you can continue to do. Uh, we appreciate you and uh, all that you've done to defend this great nation and just thank you. Just, that's all I can. Well, thank you, say. Chief. The Lord says you are supposed to be forgiving, so I forgive you for getting out of the ring going going to <laughs> my forgiveness. <laughs> Listen, I, I got the Eagle Globe and Anchor tatted somewhere on me. I, I can't tell you where it's at, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, once a Marine, always a Marine, definitely. Yeah, but, uh, indeed. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. If you could hold uh, hold for a second after the live, and uh, I got to get some information from you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Chief Chat out. Chat out. Bye. <laughs>